My beady geese and soyvan. All the world's a stage. Totus mundus agit histrionum. Shijie, Josuke Utai. Shara bisho ekti moncho. Hello everybody and welcome to Shakespeare's Birthday Bash. Uh, a huge welcome to everybody here in the Zoom room who's joining us today and also to anyone who's watching from wherever you are on YouTube. Um, before I say anything else, I'm going to hand over to our Chair of Trustees, Barbara Stowe, for an official welcome to the event. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Amy. Well, hello from Wales. What a small world we live in. And um, tragically, of course, the global pandemic has reminded us if we'd forgotten just how small the world is and how much we have in common and how together we must care for each other and for our fragile, beautiful planet that's entrusted to us for future generations. For me, the magic of the theatre and um, and for, with no writer more than Shakespeare, is precisely to show us how much we have in common across time and across the globe, and to help us go some way to imagine what it's like to walk in the shoes of other people, no matter how different our lives might seem to be. On behalf of Shakespeare Link, I am honored this is the official bit, and I am so excited to be able to welcome old friends and new from across the globe as we come together to celebrate the poetry, the wisdom, the fun, and the birthday of William Shakespeare. So welcome all and let the revels begin. Thanks so much for that, Barbara, adding a real sense of occasion, as always. Um, so, yeah, I just want to also mention Erin, who's our technical manager. So for anyone watching live on YouTube, that's who I'm referring to when I say thanks, Erin, throughout the afternoon. I haven't gone mad. Um, you can imagine me as a sort of um, Chris Whitty uh, figure and Erin, who's queuing up the next slide, though hopefully I'll be a little bit more charismatic, um, but that's that's not a given. Um, so I think all I need to say is YouTubers do comment along, uh, do send us pictures, do ask questions, and we will try to include those in the afternoon as we go. Um, and I think that's it. We've got a lot to get through. So on with the show. And what better way to start than by flying east to Beijing, where we were going to hear live from a long term Willow Globe friend, Ben Fellows, but he's been a bit busy at the moment uh, having twins. So uh, thank you, Ben, for being so considerate and Shakespearean in your choice of offspring there. Um, and instead we're going to have a recorded performance of a monologue, which I think we'll all, we'll all know. Um, so thanks, Erin. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. And then, the whining schoolboy, with his satchel, shiny morning face, creeping like a snail, unwillingly to school. Then the 
，叹息着。写了一首悲哀的诗歌，咏着他恋人的眉毛。And then the soldier, full of strange oaths, and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, 爱惜着名誉 ，sudden and quick in quarrel， 动不动就要打架 ，seeking the bubble reputation, even the cannon's mouth. Then the justice, in fair round belly with a good cape and lined, eye severe, beard of a formal cut. Fourth, wise saws in modern instances. 他是这样扮演了他的一个角色 The sixth age shifts to the lean, slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. His useful hose a Well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank. 而他那朗朗的男人口音，又变成了孩子似的尖叫，像是吹着风笛或哨子。The last scene of all, which ends this strange, eventful history, is second childishness and mere. Oblivion. 没有牙齿，没有眼睛，没有口味。Sounds everything. Welcome back, everybody, and thanks so much to Tommy, who we've got here with us today for that wonderful、uh, speech. I personally have horrible memories of that speech and completely forgetting my lines、uh, at a performance in Milton Keynes. So I'm really, really impressed that you managed to get through all seven stages of man because I think I only managed about four, and two of them I said twice. So really, really well done, and thank you so much for sending that in.、Um, so we're going to cross about as many.、Uh, Time zones, as I think it's possible to cross now, and、uh, head over to North Carolina, where I believe Creighton and his music students are finishing up a lesson, and they are going to treat us to a song rendition of Sonnet Fifty Five. So, Creighton, we are ready when you are. All right. There's not much more to say. I just want to introduce these students really quickly. This is Lauren. This is Nate. This is Primo over here on guitar. This is Jana. Vocals, Charlie over here on the other piano. Nate's on the bass over here. Lauren's on this piano, and we have been. We just make music in this class, so it just sort of there's no musical knowledge requirement. We just kind of come in and learn about music by making music. And one thing we did recently was set a sonnet, one of one that actually Lauren wrote, and then we figured you can use the same music for any sonnet, and we found one that fit the the day. And here's a testament to Shakespeare's words lasting longer than. Longer than bronze, as Horace would say. Primo, you ready? One, two, three. No marble, nor the gilded monument. Of princes shall outlive this land for all, but you shall shun the bright discontents. Then eyes will stain the sleeping sunshine. When these four shall touch these altars. Thank、you. 
Thank you so much, Creighton, and all the students at North Carolina. That was wonderful. Lovely to hear something live. Um, and thanks so much for being here with us today. So, so, so good to see you guys. I'll be tuning in later on and just watching and enjoying it and loving it. Great. See you then. Brilliant. Thanks, Creighton. Amazing. That was lovely. Um, and a very excellent choice, I think. That's a sonnet about the enduring nature of love, um, despite time passing and against the odds. And I think that's why we're all here today um, to keep the spirit of, um, of love alive, despite all the barriers that have been put in our way this year and stopping us meeting in person. So um, wonderful stuff. Um, Gavin's just entered the waiting room. So I'm gonna let Gavin in um, or someone else has done it. Perfect. Hi, Gavin. <laughs> Oh, thank goodness. You made it. Excellent. Um, you're here just in time for a trip to Kolkata. We were going to go to Russia first, but I don't think the Russians have made it into the Zoom just yet. So instead, I'm going to introduce everyone to Shuktara, who is uh, phoning in, Zooming in from India. Um, what time is it with you there? Um, it's 6.43 p.m. Okay, getting near, near, nearing cocktail hour. <laughs> um, yeah. Laura and I, um, we didn't actually meet, but she watched a performance of Twelfth Night that I was lucky enough to be in um, when I was over in India in 2015. And we've since reconnected for this event via a mutual friend. And it's absolutely lovely to, to have you here with us today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Shuktara now, who's going to tell us a little bit about the drama therapy work that she does over in India usually and how that may have been uh, a little bit different this year uh, and how they've coped with with those changes. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll just preface this by saying that uh, right now where uh, India is in the middle of a absolutely atrocious uh, surge with the pandemic, um, it's much worse than it was uh, last year. So uh, it's uh, it's something that all of us are obviously uh, completely overwhelmed by. Um, so so th that, and, and therefore, I mean, I, I'm still, a part of me is still very much uh, a bit out of it because uh, of everything that's uh, happening around me with people I know. Um, but, uh, but regardless, I mean, there is something about theater and there's something about uh, feeling connected in whatever way one can uh, to people in the theater community, whether it's uh, within the city that I'm in, Kolkata, or outside of Kolkata in India, and then internationally with all of you. Um, and it's something that I think uh, gives a kind of anchor. So going from there to uh, drama therapy, I think uh, last year, uh, I, I would say that uh, I found uh, drama therapy to be more of a, a useful kind of uh, space last year when uh, the pandemic was something that all of us were grappling with. Uh, 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 I mean, I'm thinking the word that is coming to my head is new, but uh, by which I really mean that it was something that it was, it was, I mean, it was a new uh, space for all of us last year, whereas this year it's been over a year and uh, we're still working through a huge number of challenges uh, internationally. Um, so uh, it, within that space, I think uh, what drama therapy or what I was trying to do with drama therapy was uh, allowing, figuring out a way in which uh, one could uh, be, be the role that one uh, needed to be to provide, uh, to get a kind of uh, comfort, to get a kind of allyship with uh, oneself. So figuring out how one could be one's ally and figuring out a role that one could uh, take on to give that kind of uh, support uh, 
intrapersonally. Uh, and that was uh, refreshing, I think. It was also um, something that, that was liberating for clients in the sense that uh, you could dress up any which way you wanted. You could um, accessorize, create props, do whatever you wanted within a space where you had some privacy. Uh, it gets tricky with people, of course, who uh, do not have safety in their uh, personal lived spaces because another massive challenge that the pandemic has thrown up across the world is domestic violence and um, increasing, right? Because uh, you have no escape outside of your home in when you're uh, locked out. Uh, so within those spaces, it's, it, it's obvious, I mean, it, 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 obvious, I don't think I need to say this, but uh, mental health has obviously been a significant uh, concern precisely because of things like this, because uh, for people who don't have safe home spaces, is going out of the home is what you need to do to try to uh, uh, to to give yourself uh, escape routes. Um, and without that, it's it's you have to sort of try to uh, create a safe sort of space for yourself within yourself because your lived space uh, is not uh, safe. So. Uh, Different types of drama therapy, depending on the need, basically. Um, and for people who were uh, living with within difficult environments, uh, what I was really trying to do was to uh, figure out a way in which we could create some kind of a ritual or a kind of uh, metaphor that might again give the give the person a kind of emotional anchor anchor uh, to fall back on. So that would be drama therapy. Yeah. That's so interesting, Shuktara, and thank you also for reminding, you know, it's really important that we remember the hardships that have happened in the last year all over the world. And I guess people like in the ones who are in this room will hopefully be appreciated for their for their skills um, in, in bringing the world out of, of a dark place. Um, you're talking there about um, using drama and role playing as an anchor and finding different ways of being, um, which I know is something everyone here will appreciate as such a therapeutic experience. So um, hopefully it will be an, an era that the likes of all our, us creative people can, can really can really lead the way. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing that and, and wonderful to hear the, uh, the Indian uh, taxis and, uh, uh, and tuk-tuks in the background. We can, we can hear them zooming in. It's uh, really atmospheric. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's lovely, it's lovely. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing, um, sharing your, your experiences of the last year. And um, we, we send all our, all our thoughts and best to you for um, a recovery out of this tricky time um, in thank India. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to fly back to Mid Wales and we're going to land in springtime uh, in the Willow Globe and hear from Doe and Herb, who are two Willow Globe actors who are going to give us their rendition of the Daffodil song from um, A Winter's Tale. So uh, thanks, Erin. begin to peer with hay the dark sea over the dale why then comes in the sweet o'er the year for the red blood reigns in the winter's pale the white sheet bleaching on the hedge with hay the sweet birds oh how they sing Set my pug in tooth on edge For a quart of ale is a dish for a king The lark, the lark, the tirralira chants With hay, with hay, the thrush and the jay Are summer songs for me and my aunts As we lay tumbling in the hay I have served Prince Florizel and in my time worn three pile <laughs> but now he's out of service 
But shall we go mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when we wander here and there, we then do most go right. We then do most go right. Welcome back everybody and thank you so much to Doe and Herb for that fantastic performance there. Um, it certainly does feel to take a line from uh, that song that we are um, in a much sweeter time of year now and, and hopefully the darkness is behind us as we step out into the light and vaccines are rolled, are rolled out and um, we feel the warmth of the sun on our skin again, particularly those of us who are emerging from a very long winter here in the UK. Um, now, I don't know about anyone else, but I am rather in need of a refreshment. Uh, after all, this is a party, and although it's only 20 past two in the UK, um, it's Shakespeare's birthday. So why don't we grab our cocktail ingredients and head on down to Shaky Bill's Swaltery Sack and Ale Bar. Well, we might have to delay our cheers to Shakespeare because I've only got as far as getting the vodka out of the fridge. I haven't even got the top off yet, but um, please do continue to mix your cocktails as we press on with the afternoon and I'll do my best to catch up, but um, we'll, ha we'll have a proper cheers later, but cheers and happy birthday, Shakespeare. Um, we are going to fly simultaneously to um, Devon, and Nairobi now, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say, um, to meet Jago and Jazz, who are new friends of the Willow Globe. Um, and they run the youth theatre, uh, a youth theatre in Kenya, um, which does some amazing work and has some incredible resonances with our very own Willow Globe. So um, if I can pass over to Jazz now, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, brilliant. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here and happy birthday, uh, Shakespeare, uh, of course. Um, I'm going to actually hand over to Jake. I'm just going to share my screen and um, let you take you on a bit of a journey here. So, yeah, Jago, over to you. Yeah, hello, everybody. And um, fabulous to be here, as Jazz says, and it's great to make new friends at the Willow Theatre. Um, We'd like to share with you our story and as storytellers, our story is the story of the Youth Theatre of Kenya and how it came about and where we're headed. Um, we started, we started in Kenya way back in 2010, where in a school, we were a group of teachers who decided to create our own piece of musical theatre called Kesho. Um, based on the story of Rwandese children in the refugee camps in the war of 1994. Um, it was a huge success. We, we, were, we loved telling a true story and a true African story. This grew, this grew. And several years later, or three years later, we took that story, Kesho, to the International Youth Arts Festival in the UK. It was a huge adventure. We had 100 students from the UK and Kenya joining together to tell this story. And it was, it was amazing. It was a fantastic experience. A year later, we went back to the International Youth Arts Festival to tell a second African story, Albatross, Wings of Freedom, which to told the story of the slave trade the East African slave trade, which is a more untold story, um, and the effects that the church had working within it. Again, it was a true story, a true story set in Africa. But while we were there, um, many of our youth in our cast thought, well, this is all very well and this is great, but what's next? What, what is there in Kenya for the youth to pursue their theatrical dreams? And so many ideas were hatched. And in the end, it was decided that we would set up our own theatre company, the Youth Theatre of Kenya. Um, Jazz and myself are two of the original four co-founders. So we set to work. Um, we are a non-for-profit uh, organization. We work across the country. Students come to us from all over Kenya. Nobody pays. Um, and the concept is to give a platform to these youth to showcase and develop their talent, to tell Kenyan and African stories, and to join this wonderful, huge family that has a huge amount of fun. So we returned with Kesho Amahoro in 2015. And then we went on to tell the story of the Iron Snake in 2017. All these stories and plays being created by ourselves together with, with the youth of Kenya. Iron Snake told the story of the creation of the first railway across Kenya from Mombasa to the West, which actually was also the creation of Kenya as a country. Then we went on and we told several other stories. Um, we've actually come up to 10 productions in, in total. We told the story of Promise, which tells the story of the East African soldiers involved in the First World War. Um, and to this date, there isn't a memorial, there isn't a named memorial. So we were, again, we were telling a story that had not yet been told. And with all of this, it's a platform for the youth of Kenya to showcase their talent, to tell their stories, and to get out there the voices that um, theatre can, can help us with. The, the, theatre is, is that platform. Um, we now run, we've now extended and we run drama and vocal classes in four, three different studios across Nairobi and online across the country. We have invited and partaken with many different international artists and companies. So that's where we've come from. And I'll hand over to Jazz, who'll take you further as to where we're going. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, we look back on this journey and we say, I was there, you know, Jago was my teacher. And I said, we went to the UK twice in 2013 and 2014. And I remember being a young man, a young boy thinking, where do I go next? And there was nothing. And both in the UK and across Europe and in America, there are youth theaters, then there is that next level. And there wasn't. And I remember sitting around a, a little uh, 
kitchen in King's College and bacon was burning. And we sat around and said, you know what? Why don't we start a youth theater? And that's exactly what we did. And it's been a brilliant journey and we're really excited. But obviously the question is, and that's me, I, I shouldn't have included that picture, but it's there. The question is, where are we going? What next? And I think it's been so uh, interesting to meet with uh, the Willow Globe and you'll see the idea that we have for the future is really, really exciting. And this is Mizizi theaters. Now Mizizi is a Swahili word meaning roots. One of our concepts is, yeah, there's theater in Nairobi, but Kenya is a huge, huge country and we need to reach way, way, way more people. And one of the ways we want to do this is by creating root theaters around the country. Our basic concept is to build an industry, you have to start at a grassroots level. You have to start with community and people. And we want to have this health space, a health space which says, you know what, we're the youth and we're gonna stand here for, this, for, for time. And through this, once you create a space for people to come together, that's when stories and culture and amazing things can come, can happen if you bring people together in a shared space, which I think is a philosophy a lot of theater makers and drama makers share. All we need is a room to be creative and it will be amazing. This, these Mazizi theaters are simple in design, but modern in concept. We would love to copy and replicate the, the Willow Globe and use nature, have, let them be eco-friendly, let them be, tell their stories by engaging with the culture and the community in these, in these different areas. There's a next question though. Once you have this space for people and you have these, this training for these actors and you have this performance space, where do they go? The truth is an industry in Kenya is growing, but it's not, it's, it's not there yet. So where, where, where do all these actors, where do these directors, where do these creators go? The next concept is to have an empty space theater. In all these Mizizi theaters, in these roots, in these connections, in our culture, in our history, we create the next place for our, for our industry to go. We build these theaters around these countries that, you know what, if you're an actor, if you're a director, you can be like, you know what, this is my career and this is where I want to go. The concept is something that is not new to Kenya. And there are, there is one really, really beautiful outdoor theater and it's called Beneath the Baobabs, but it focuses more on live music as opposed to, as opposed to theater making. And this is a great picture from it. Um, and it's really, really, really wonderful. And hopefully in the future, with your help, we can, and, and the help of the world around us, we can, we can make it happen and we can, we can tell great stories for, for the time to come. Uh, thank you very much. It's been brilliant. Thank you for having us. And once again, happy birthday, Shakespeare. <laughs> well done. Absolutely brilliant. And um, very informative, very interesting, and long enough for me to make my cocktail. So cheers, happy birthday, Shakespeare. Thanks so much to Jazz and Jago for that. Um, Brilliant. It's really, it's really interesting to hear um, Sue was telling us on a Zoom yesterday about the importance of having a contained space in which Jamie Wilkes has joined. Hello, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> um, to have a contained space. Um, where ideas can be nurtured and created and protected and then sent out into the wider world. And it feels like that's exactly what you guys are um, working towards uh, in Kenya. And I know that Phil and Sue would love to have you and your youth theatre over to the Willow um, in the near future. So yeah, big thumbs up there. Um, so next we have a very interesting musical offering from Simon Fraser, who's a trust, trustee here at Shakespeare Link um, and is also uh, often the musical director of the Willow Globe Company, um, sound engineer, basic all round uh, clever guy who has been spending his lockdown learning uh, and practicing the viol. And he's come up with some very interesting connections between a piece called La Volta by William Byrd um, and Cymbeline, which is, of course, the community production this year at the Willow. So um, I won't say any more, but I'll hand over to Erin, who's going to play the video for us. Thanks, Erin. Item one. Item take one.
Afternoon everybody. Uh, this is a little item um, about music and the spheres. Uh, so I'll start with uh, asking you a question. What have you been doing in lockdown? I'm really interested. Obviously you can't answer me. So I'm going to tell you what I've been doing. Some of the time I've been practicing the viol. Um, the viol being an instrument you may not be that familiar with. Here's one. It's a little one. This is the baby one. This is the uh, treble vial. It comes in bigger sizes. There's a middle one and a big one. And you'll see them later. Um, and hear them, hopefully. So I was practicing the vial and I came across this piece by uh, Galilei, Vincenzo Galilei, which was published in 1584. So Shakespeare was 20. So that's quite interesting. I was thinking, ah, hang on. Is there any link uh, between Galileo and, Gal and Vincenzo? And sure enough, Galileo is Vincenzo's son, who was born in, in 1564, in February actually. So he's two months um, older than Shakespeare. And then I thought, well, Galileo is famous for his astronomy and science. Did anybody, uh, does anybody know if they connected so I looked a few things up. So let's just go back to Vincenzo. What was he, he, he about? Well, he played the lute, uh, which is a kind of plucked instrument, a uh, bit like that, this one here, um, of, of the guitar kind of family. Um, and he wrote music. And uh, sure enough, that's where the La Volta came, came from, his book of, of music he'd written for two lutes. Now, Galileo was also a Galileo the, the astronomer was also a musician taught by his dad no doubt and um, he played the lute and when he was 20 this was published this piece La Volta so you can't imagine that they didn't play the piece you'll hear in a moment um, on, but we're going to play it Trudy and I are going to play it on two vials um, but it was actually written out by Vincenzo Galilei for, for two lutes and Galilei, Vincenzo would have taught um, Galileo uh, some of his science as well, and maybe that's how he got interested in science. Anyway, Galileo Galilei was obviously got interested in astronomy, and um, quite a bit later, he in 1609, he uh, discovered or was introduced to a, a, a kind of early telescope, uh, and he observed the, the moons of Jupiter. And he wrote this down in a little booklet called Siderius Nuncius, or The Starry Messenger. Um, and he published this book in March 1610. So here we have um, Galileo um, talking about the moons of Jupiter the four moons of Jupiter, he could see these four moons, um, which were later called Io, Europa, Callisto and Ganymede. And uh, then I was thinking, well, is there a link uh, between Jupiter, um, the, the moon, the, the moons of Jupiter and Jupiter, the Roman god that we see in Cymbeline? Well, yes, there is. At least I think there is. Um, because in Cymbeline, our hero Posthumus, when he's in prison, he's visited by Jupiter, and there are four spirits um, it, it, around about. And sure enough, um, Jupiter gives them a book to give to Posthumus. But we don't know what the book is, but perhaps it's a starry messenger. So how do we know any of this? Well, um, Obviously, at the time, um, the, there was quite an interest in astronomy. And in this little book uh, that, that Galileo wrote, he thanks a, a French lord called Jacques Baldevere. Ba Badevere. And Jacques uh, was actually um, born, he christened uh, Giacomo, which is quite interesting because Giacomo is in Cymbeline. Uh, and what does Giacomo use to get close to make his observations uh, in the bedroom scene? He uses a trunk 
Well, a trunk in Shakespeare's time was also a name for a telescope. And when he says he observes 10,000 mean movables, could that be a reference to the 10,000 stars that were thought to be the number of stars that you could see with the naked eye? And, and why does Cymbeline at the end say, does the world go round? Well, the thing about the, the uh, research that, um, the theory that Galileo came up with, is that he, he observed that the moons went round the, the planet Jupiter, and if they go round the planet Jupiter and not round the Earth, then the Earth isn't the centre of the universe. And that was a very contentious thing to say. And in fact, Galileo was imprisoned or put under house arrest for suggesting that uh, the, the theory of Copernicus was actually true. He sort of validated the theory of Copernicus, that the, the Earth goes round the, the Sun rather than the other way round. So there we are. You'll now hear um, the La Volta, followed by a piece by Bird. Uh, it's, a, it's the Earl of Salisbury's Pavan, and then you'll hear the Volta again. Thank you. And happy birthday. Happy birthday, Willow Globe, 15th today, and happy birthday, Shakespeare. And thanks for listening. Bye for now.
Hello everyone and welcome back and thank you so much to Simon and the dancers for that wonderful, uh, wonderful piece there. Very interesting. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, for our last offering before our interval, we are going to head over to Latvia to hear from some long term friends of the Willow Globe. Um, who are going to, who, who have sent in a trailer for their mesmerizing forest production of um, A Midsummer Night's Dream. So we'll watch that trailer and then we'll hear from the makers of that show um, and then we shall come back. So thanks very much, Erin. Off we go to Latvia. was our production of Midsummer Night's Dream as a part of the Latvian Stories project in the pristine and wild Pokain forest in Latvia. On the occasion of Shakespeare's birthday, we would like to send our warmest greetings to Willow Globe, who were responsible for inspiring the entire community and applied theatre movement in Latvia. Welcome back everybody once again and I'd just like to take a moment to say a special hello to our friends watching on YouTube. Um, if everyone could give Akon, who's in France a wave, Shazia who's in London, Dawn in New York and Alison and Davina. I'm not sure if I've pronounced that right. I'm so sorry but wherever you two are, hello to you and thank you for being with us. It's really great to know that you're there even though we can't, we can't see you. Um, we are speaking of uh, making uh, connections and sharing Shakespeare, which of course is what Shakespeare Link is all about. We are going to hear a quick hello from Kathy Mack, who uh, is our Shakespeare Link in Canada, our That's sister neighbor. venue. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to talk to Yeva first. That was <laughs> Yeva that we just, thank you, Sue. <laughs> So that was sorry. Who we just saw um, who, who, her production of A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Latvian Stories project. So, um, Yeva, if you'd just like to say hello to everyone watching on YouTube. Hi, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all in Shakespeare's birthday and cheers. <laughs> well done. <laughs> we wish you had your crown on. We wish you could see your crown right now. 
Well, the because... crown, what you saw on the video, it was actually it Titania's did. crown from the production of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, Titania was running all over the forest with this crown. So that, that's why we were so eager to show you this. Uh, this yeah. <laughs> so, guys, you've got to, if you haven't already seen the videos, you must pick up and look at them because they're so beautiful. All of them are beautiful. But these crowns merit attention. <laughs> And yeah, and thanks to thanks to Phil and Sue, and thanks to Willow Globe, we are actually able to have a um, applied um, applied theater community theater movement in Latvia and all this method. And uh, we were yeah we were encouraged to do it, and now we are continuing. And this movement even grown into a Baltic applied theater school. So yeah, thank you very much. We are very happy that we had this opportunity to meet you, and uh, now we can continue this uh, this job. Yeah. Brilliant. 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 Hooray. Well, it's really lovely to have you both with us today. Um, so now I think what we'll do as we're approaching our interval is to uh, hear from Kathy Mack in Canada, who sent a hello and a hooray into us uh, to mark the day. Um, and then we have uh, a short animation piece and then we'll go into our 10 minute interview. Interview? Oh dear. One too many of these. I think the shot was a bit large. Uh, our 10 minute interval. Um, so that's goodbye from us on Zoom for a little while. And we shall see you in about 15 minutes. Bye. <laughs> Hello, everybody at Shakespeare Link. This is Kathy Mack from Shakespeare Link Canada. And I am recording this message because I'm unable to be with you this morning on Shakespeare's birthday. And I'm wanting you to know that I'm sending lots of love and happy birthday wishes to William Shakespeare from Stratford, Ontario. Just to give you a little update of what's been happening here since last year at this time in the pandemic, we haven't been able to do theater. The government has shut down theaters here and there's been very little outdoor activity even. Ontario is right now in the third wave of the pandemic and our cases last week were up very close to 5,000 people a day um, contracting the virus. So we went into a stay-at-home order, which will be six weeks in its total. At this time, the Stratford Festival, where I also work, is the head of voice. We're planning a season for the summer underneath tents. There will be two tents at the festival, and they're hoping to do six plays and five cabarets. None of the companies will work in rep as we have in seasons past. They will be solo shows like solo companies and there will be no company greater than eight in the, in the cast. So we will do an eight person version of Romeo and Juliet and an eight person version of A Midsummer Night's Dream as well as other plays on our docket. We're hoping that this is going to be possible. We're hoping that we will be able to be distanced and 100 people outside. Stratford's numbers have been fairly low. And last summer we were able to do that, although the festival was not in a position to coordinate that season at the time. So we're, do, we're doing this season based on what could have been possible last year had we have had the foresight to be able to put that together in a hurry. Um, so that's where things are here. Artists are quite sad and facing challenging times really but there has been as there has been around the world a lot of things happening on zoom i've just come off of three days on a workshop on dream uh, working toward our rehearsal period which will also be condensed instead of two and a half months we will rehearse in three weeks so lots of changes but we are moving forward with hope with resilience with perseverance and um and doing the best that we can, really. I think that everybody is just doing the best that they can. So wishing I could be there with you today and sending you lots and lots of love. Until soon. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more <coughs> and more <coughs> Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. <coughs> And summer's lease hath all too short a date.
Welcome to the first edition of Famous Past Lives. Today's guest is regarded by many as the greatest playwright the world has ever known. He's written 37 plays, 154 sonnets, and two epic poems. And as we celebrate 457 years since his birth, I'd like to welcome the writer, poet, and playwright, William Shakespeare. Or may I call you Will? Yes, Will's fine. The world's greatest playwright, yet you started your career as an actor. What made you take up writing? The company needed new material, and a lot of it. You must remember, uh, we were performing five plays a week. There was a, a lot of competition, and to make any money at all, you had to draw upwards of 2,000 spectators a day. <laughs> I found I had an aptitude for it, so I churned them out. And, and where did you get your ideas from? Oh, I just pinched other people's ideas. Actually, it was a collaborative effort. The other actors would lend me books, tell me stories they'd heard, or I'd adapt someone else's play. Um, what do you say to the criticism that you were a plagiarist? I'm thinking of Robert Greene's attack on you as, a, I quote, an upstart crow beautified with our feathers. <laughs> well, he had a big chip on his shoulder because he couldn't make it as a writer. Um, but as to being a plagiarist, um, I took mediocre plays and made them 10 times, 20 times better. I don't think the audiences complained. And what do you consider your greatest success? Outliving Marlowe. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I was very fond of him, but the fact that he died young meant I had no real competition. But uh, what do you consider your best play? Mm, oh, that's a hard one. They were all good. Well, maybe not The Gardener's Mistress. Oh, I, I don't think we know that one. Oh, that's a relief. It was terrible. No jokes and no deaths. Now, Titus Andronicus. I lost count of the number of deaths in that one. The audience love the play that ends with the stage covered in corpses. Many consider Hamlet to be your best work. Really? I was going through a bit of an existential crisis at the time. Did it show through in the play, do you think? <laughs> You kept acting throughout your career, so you were writing, acting and running a theatre, basically one of the actor managers of the time. How did you cope? Where did you find the energy? How did you recharge your batteries? Yes, it was a crazy time. I was burning the candle at both ends, quite literally. Mornings would be spent at the theatre rehearsing. The performance took up the whole afternoon and I spent the evenings and most of the nights writing new work, rewriting scenes from the day's performance that hadn't worked with the audience, writing out the actors' parts and learning my own lines. It was mad. I might catch a bit of rest and relaxation with a friend after the show, but mostly it was work, work, work. There's been much speculation about your private life, principally because nothing is known about it. So people have had to draw inferences from the subjects of your sonnets. They come across as deeply personal. Was there a dark lady in your affections and a beautiful youth? Ah, well, now look, a man has a right to a private life. What I did or did not do and with whom is really my affair. As to the sonnets, I just made them up. You're not going to sell some generalized poem dedicated to a tree, are you? But if you make it as if it was written for a woman with raven black eyes, then all the dark eyed women out there can imagine it was written for them. Early on, you left a wife and family in Stratford when you moved to London and never really went back to them. Why was that? Well, you have to understand, I was only 18 when she got pregnant. I wouldn't have got married otherwise. 
I was just having fun like all young men do. But she was considerably older than me and wanted to settle down. And with a father standing over me, what could I do? She would have hated London. She was a farmer's daughter. She liked the country. Me, I couldn't wait to get away. Even with the plague, the violence and the food riots, I loved London. But mostly I loved the theater. You'd never have a decent theater in Stratford, never in a hundred years. So it had to be London. It was where it was all happening. Anyway, I did right by Anne. I bought her a big house in Stratford, made her wealthy, left her well provided for after my death. Is that true? After all, there's only one mention of Anne in your will, the bequest of the second best bed. Why not the best one? <laughs> oh, people won't let that go, will they? She automatically qualified for a third of my estate, so she wasn't left destitute. And anyway, she was 60, an old woman, when I died. The best bed was too big for her on her own and too high. She complained that she kept falling out of it. So I left her the other one, which was smaller, cosier. She liked her comfort. Going back to your life in the theatre, what are your fondest memories? All oh, the laughs. Burbage, Hemmings, Will Kemp. We had such a laugh together. L like the time we dismantled the theatre in Shoreditch right under the landlord's nose and literally carted it over the bridge and rebuilt it in Southwark so we didn't have to pay his extortionate rent. And the time we rehearsed The Winter's Tale for the first time and an escaped bear <clears throat> from the bear pit next door lumbered onto the stage just as Antigonus was about to do his lines. Ha! You should have seen him run. That gave me a great idea for the scene, of course. Exited pursued by a bear. How we laughed. Will Shakespeare, on that note, we must bring this interview to a reluctant close. But thank you for taking time out from your celestial afterlife to talk to us today. Oh, you're most Hello and welcome back to the second half of Shakespeare's Birthday Bash. Uh, we're, we're all still here, we're all still going. Uh, it's going brilliantly and amazing to hear from the birthday boy himself there. Um, and uh, the, the secrets to great writing, uh, which is apparently I just made it up. Um, what a show off, but happy birthday to Shakespeare. Cheers, happy birthday. <laughs> Um, we heard a lot in that animation about Will's time at uh, the Globe in London. So uh, just before we move on to our next guest speaker, I'd like to remind everybody that Shakespeare's Globe is holding an event this summer, um, their Shakespeare and Climate Emergency Symposium, featuring our very own Willow Globe as part of the lineup this evening. Um, and Kat is going to pop the link to that in the chat if anyone would like to register for a ticket to watch any of their talks and events uh, this weekend. Um, so I'd just actually like to say a quick hello to some of our YouTube uh, viewers. We've got Nick in Wiltshire and Brooke in Oregon and The Heat in Sri Lanka. So hello to you guys and thanks so much for being with us. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Wet Mariner Tom Sims, who is going to tell us a little bit about how his theatre company have worked in slightly different ways uh, with the Willow Globe this year because of the restrictions that we've um, been placed under. Um, so I won't say any more. I'll just uh, hand over to Tom. 
Hello, uh, hello everyone. Hello everyone on the call, everyone watching along uh, on YouTube. And uh, as Amy said, yes, I'll be talking about not, not just my theatre company, but in fact, the theatre company that Amy herself and some of the other faces here are, are part of uh, called the Wet Mariners. And um, yes, we I will be talking about essentially Shakespeare on Zoom. So I will share my screen as I've got a few... Um, slides and images let's just check can everyone see that if i present now is that working yeah we can see. okay there we are so yes shakespeare on zoom well uh let me go all the way back to 1899 which was when the world was treated to shakespeare as they had never seen it before uh they were given in 1899, by these uh, these three uh, intriguing chaps, William Kennedy, Laurie Dixon, and Walter Fafadando, uh, a four minute film of King John, which, uh, side note, at the time was an absolute hoot, and everyone loved King John. It was one of the most popular plays of the time, and what a shame that we don't do it all the time today. So let's bring back more King Johns and less Hamlets. Uh, but here's a still from it. This is the death of King John, and um, this was from uh, Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree's production. And they, what they did was they filmed four uh, scenes, about a minute long, and, and they showcased it to the world. Uh, this is on YouTube if you want to uh, Google it. Uh, the, there's only one scene remains, it's this one. And um, spoiler alert, he, he dies, but he does take about a minute 16 to die, which is pretty, pretty, pretty worthwhile watching because talk about milking your death scene. <laughs> this is really up there with, with, with some of the, uh, the, the, the greats. So um, that, you know, that kind of, we, a, a, a flip was um, switched, I guess you could say, in the history of time there, because that was the first time that the work of Shakespeare had been captured on film. And it was, you know, for all intents and purposes, an attempt to capture, to preserve a stage production of the time. And I guess you could argue that it was unsuccessful because it didn't have any sound. So, um, you know, it was obviously somewhat lacking if it was trying to capture what it must have been like to watch that production. Uh, although, obviously, let's be honest, we still have sound issues today, even with Zoom and the technology that we've got. But it must have been absolutely dazzling uh, for those people in 1899 to just conjure players in front of their very eyes, performing the Bard's work, even if it was in complete silence. Um, now, obviously people, uh, as we know, really took to film as a way of telling stories and similar films were made in the intervening years, people trying to capture stage shows. But uh, it wasn't really until 1908 when someone said, hang on a minute, I think we might be doing this, this wrong. And so in 1908, we get a film by an amazing pioneer called Percy Stowe of The Tempest. And what's amazing about this film is that I think this is the first time when a director goes, hang on a minute, let's not ask, like, how can we capture The Tempest on film? But let's actually ask, what does The Tempest look like on film? And so he creates this incredible film, which is also on YouTube, should you want to watch it, very easy to, to Google. Um, and he creates a piece of work that many scholars would now agree is, is the first cinematic version of Shakespeare's work designed specifically for the medium of film. So what we get is we get some amazing things here where he's got like a backdrop uh, in front of a live sea and then a puppet of a boat. So this is you know, conjuring the storm, Prospero conjuring uh, the boats here, which is just such a clever way of going, let's not just film, you know, something that's on the stage. Let's actually use live uh, elements of the world. Let's overlay things on them. And let's get the actors in front. Um, he also does a brilliant moment when Ariel, who you can see down here, bottom left, uh, is doing a scene with Caliban, where he realizes, oh, with editing, I can just make Ariel disappear or transform. And so this is a still from one frame. And one second later, we get this, which is that 
Ariel's disappeared and turned into a monkey, which is quite hard to see. So I have circled it here for you. Um, and then essentially this monkey just <laughs> crawls about on this log and then he cuts again and Ariel pops back up. And, you know, that to me is, is so innovative and so playful and someone going, look, it, 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 we've got this new technology. Let's not try and capture what we've got. Let's try and make something new. Um, and that to me is, is why this piece of work has always um, struck a chord with me, because what it does is it eschews all these ideas about what might be considered right. Uh, and instead it goes like, yeah, right, let's look at what we've actually got here to tell a story and let's tell it fresh, let's tell it new. Now, as Amy said, the theatre company that I'm part of and that other people are part of that I've already mentioned called the Wet Mariners, I think that that's one of our core beliefs and ideas actually is that we don't go well how do you do Hamlet how do you do King John how do you do any play we go well what does this play look like here in this space as opposed to any other space so when every year we come to the willow and mount a production we don't bring any ideas other than well here's the text and here's the cast. It changes. Sometimes there's 10 of us. Sometimes there's four of us. Sometimes there's, sometimes there's only an audience of, of uh, 20 because of restrictions. Sometimes it's overflowing of people. But each and every time, something is different. And so you never replicate. You ask, OK, well, what does that mean for the story we're about to tell? The audience changes. So how does that affect, you know, what we're trying to tell? And um, obviously, we, uh, as a company we faced a rather difficult creative challenge last year, because as everyone knows, that's why we're here on this call now. Um, we were forced, all of us, into our homes, out of the theatres, but we as a company decided, well, look, we've got to keep that principle alive. We couldn't meet to rehearse a play, uh, let alone perform one <laughs> to a live audience, and we couldn't even get together and film a play. Uh, but there was something we could do, we could get together virtually, as we all are now, on this new technology, Zoom. And uh, well, uh, I mean, what on earth the audience is watching that original film of Shakespeare back in 1899 would make of being able to see and hear in the comforts of their own home from all over the world, actors performing Shakespeare in colour and with sound live. I mean, who knows? That would probably would have uh, been far too much for them to, to handle. But I also think that even in 2020, many people across the world had that same sense of awe and wonder when they realized what this bit of software can actually do, because it is kind of amazing. And I'm even blown away sitting here today uh, behind the scenes and with another device watching the live YouTube thinking, this is, this is amazing. What an amazing thing that you guys have done and organized today as well. And that's only a year on from people first going, oh, hang on a minute, we're stuck inside. So let's see Zoom to sort of, to have fun. Um, so what we did was we put together a Zoom Shakespeare play. We called it a Midsummer Night Stream. Uh, and, and we did it last year. And we decided that, um, well, well, look, we've got to find a way to keep that magic despite the restrictions. Uh, and so we've got to find a way to perform the Bard's work that isn't just it being captured on Zoom, but actually uses Zoom. Um, now, look, we weren't the first to do it. Many, many other companies, I'm sure, had done similar things. Um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to capture a little bit of that Percy Stowe spirit and ask not how can a Midsummer Night's Dream look on Zoom, but rather, you know, what does it look like on Zoom? And, and what can we do to tell this story over Zoom? Uh, so what, what have you got? Well, you know, you've got a small box and you've got yourself and, and that's kind of it. So here's a still from the production with Amy as Titania and Shars as Oberon. And we started playing around with, okay, well, can we make it look like they're looking at each other? Can you, and, and that didn't work. So we threw that idea out pretty quickly and we realized what's the most captivating is if you look straight down the camera, if you look straight down the lens and your scene partner looks straight down the lens too, because then as an audience, you get a clear view of the actors, you get a clear view of the characters, but it also translates that they're talking to each other. Um, and then, 
you think, okay, well, the call, we've, we've kind of locked that in. Well, what else have you got? You've got your background, okay? Well, what can we do with the background? Well, here, they've added some nice flourishes to give it a, a, a setting. Um, you can also try and make the backgrounds blend. So here's Kat and I both using a similar looking house plant and placing it at the same to, to kind of make this view that maybe we're in the same space. Maybe we're in some sort of forest or, or garden or, or, or what have you. Um, and then we thought, OK, well, we've got a way to bring people together and make it look like they're talking to each other. But how on earth do you interact physically? We're in we're in a completely different space. So we got to thinking and we had a play and then we realized, well, you can lean through the camera, you can make it look like you're going through into a sort of a nether space. And so actually, if you want to, you could grab the other performer through the screen uh, and you could make it look like your hand was, was reaching through and, uh, and, and doing something that uh, perhaps it shouldn't. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we, we suddenly had all these great playful ideas of handing things across the internet into somebody else's space who would receive it. Again, something that, you know, is completely unique to the, the idea of doing it on a call. Um, and so, you know, that, that is essentially what we, what we managed to create. And I know that some of you watched it uh, live when we broadcast it on YouTube. I, I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Um, my girlfriend in my flat was very perplexed watching me because, of course, her view of what I was doing was this, uh, where you can see that my laptop is on a stand, my props are ready to go, and, uh, you know, everything outside the frame is completely ludicrous. But, of course, what the world saw was there, just that small frame in the bottom left. And I just love looking at those two images and kind of really um, seeing the difference between th that as a performance live in my room, as opposed to what the camera on my laptop is sharing with the world. Um, and so really what I want to sort of finish with is that for me, it was such a lovely experience because, um, you know, what, what we put out there last year is in no way going to change completely the, the shape of theatre. I don't think companies are looking to shut up shop and shift everything over to Zoom. Zoom has huge limitations. But what that exercise did, for me at least, was it turned quite a scary time of restrictions into a creative opportunity. And for the first time in eight years, we managed to get all 10 members of our company together in a play. Some are in America, some are all over the UK. And um, yeah, it, it gave us a chance to share with a wider audience than we've ever been able to play to. And it, um, it just put a smile, I think, at least on our faces. And if that isn't an achievement enough, then you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know what is. And, and so I think Shakespeare does have a place on Zoom. And um, we've recently done a project with Shakespeare Link called Unprecedented, where we've tried to take scenes from Shakespeare and his contemporaries and put them online and share them out there in a way that says something which Barbara commented on earlier, which is that Shakespeare allows us to connect. And actually we may feel trapped at the moment in our little boxes all over the world, but events like this, and Shakespeare on Zoom and all the mad creative things we can do actually create that something was mentioned before by the Kenya Youth Theatre, which is if you bring people in a room, magic will happen. And you know what? We can bring people in a virtual room and virtual magic can happen. So um, that's what I want to leave you all with. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Tom. Tom is such a natural storyteller and speaker, so vivacious, so full of energy. And it's absolutely great to hear about how creative challenges have always been a part of uh, performers' lives, a la Percy Stowe. Um, so that's in some way a comfort. And also just to say that we will have a new unprecedented release on Monday. So um, you can check out our YouTube channel for that. Um, but now we are going to journey east to a town six miles south of Moscow, where I believe the Mechanicals are about to cast their play. Okay, thank you for having us today. Uh, well, we still don't have queens, so unfortunately I have to read for queens. Sorry for that. So just 30 seconds and we start. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ты что? Is all our company here? You were best to call them generally, one by one, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens to play now in salute before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good the queens, Sable played red song, then with name of the actress. And so grew to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and Mary. Now, good be the quits. Call for your actors. Master, spread us up. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name it part there for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, sat down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover. Or a tyrant, a lover that kills himself, most gallant for love. That will last some tears in the troop before none it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms, I will condone some measures. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. And fifth scar shall shine from far and make it mark the foolish fates. That was lovely. Now make the rest of the players. Okay, that's all in one. You shall play it in a mask and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Fisby too. I will speak in a monster little voice. <laughs> no, no, no. You must play Pyramids and flute you Fisby. Well, proceed. Have his life's part written, cry you, if it be, you to me for. I'm slow of study. You may do it extempo, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the line too. I will roar, that I will do anyone's heart good to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I will roar, that I will make the duke say, let him roar again, let him roar again. <laughs> you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies, that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. I grant you, friends, if you should fight the ladies out to their beats, they will know more discretion, but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice, so that I will roar you as gently as any second time. I will roar you and fear <laughs> any night for you. <laughs> You can play more for that game. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced ah, man. Uh, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman, a liked man. Therefore you must play Pyramus. Well, I will not take it. What beers I'm good to play it in. Why? What you will? We will meet, and then we may rehearse more thoroughly and courageously. Take pains, be perfect. And you, at the Duke's all we meet. <laughs>
year but couldn't for obvious reasons so we really really hope to see you over here soon and thank you so much for bringing that wonderful performance to us today and well done Daria for stepping in last minute as Peter Quince excellent work <laughs> um, so now I am going to hand straight over to two people who I'm sure you've all been dying to hear more from okay. um, it's Phil and Sue in the willow So, those wonderful yellow jackets, fantastic show from Russia, and it just looks like this Jackie shows them this house lips. They're so wonderful. This is outside the Willow Theatre at the moment. And what's been so brilliant about today, I just want to say that all our belief that all things connect is absolutely reinforced by everything that's happening on Zoom and the very fact that so many of us are here today is just sort of miraculous, but it's there. With all things to do connect. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Willow Globe. So there's a moment in every birthday bash when we celebrate last year's season and look forward to treats in store. Last year, of course, was very strange locked down even before we opened up. But in that tiny gap in the lockdown, when we were allowed to gather up to 30 socially distanced, we managed to host three different live shows. The Wet Mariners opened a few days creating a, or spent a few days creating a wonderful comedy of errors, five shows in two days. And we had a brilliant visit from the Everyman Youth Theatre in Cardiff, and they brought their energetic and, and very moving Tempest. Erin, I think you've got a, a sight of the shipwrecked mariners where they're about to be shipwrecked on their boat in a storm. And Trinculo and Stefano managed not to get too close to each other on stage by wearing these enormous rubber duck rings that they'd had to wear to be able to swim in the sea to get to the island. Austin Allen created us to, treated us to Allen Ginsberg's howl on the 65th anniversary of its first reading. And we ran a load of engagement workshops. Jackie, I think you should pan around the theatre because it's so nice. And I can just talk, can I, if I keep this going? Go on then. Yeah, okay. So we, we did loads of engagement workshops, all via this miraculous new medium, Zoom. We had um, mid and north powers mind sessions supporting young people. We had young um, film techie makers doing a techie workshops with actually happened live here in that lovely gap when we were able to gather in the open air. And we had have a go, weekly have a go get togethers for the over 50s and all the feedback from all of them was that they really provided a lifeline. 
And we're part of the amazing um, Cymbeline in the Anthropocene project. And open air companies around the world are looking at environmental issues through the lens of Shakespeare. We took our Cymbeline rehearsals online, getting to know the play. We opened a sharing Cymbeline YouTube for anyone who wanted to get involved and initiated sharing Shakespeare talks on Zoom. And to those of you who generously gave your time for these, thank you very much. We think they're all still available on YouTube if you missed them. And um, I think it's a minor lord in All's World at Ensworth who says, the web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. And these are then difficult mingled times. And we'd like to mark the losses of the COVID year with the Willow Globe Company tribute. Owen is doing the music for Cymbeline and he created the music for that famous well-known song, Dirge for Fidele. And somehow miraculously he got us all to um, record ourselves remotely and he pulled it all together with technology, technological wizardry. I think Erin's got a video of it. And since we couldn't have a bash in 2020, we thought we'd just share something from 2019's Pericles. It's, it's Marina's song, and she sings of the power of love. This is Caitlin. Zanah, 
We look forward, if regulations permit, to live shows this summer. Mid Wales Opera will bring summer music. The Wet Mariners come with Twelfth Night, a mystery offering from the factory actors. Every Man Youth Theatre planned to bring Henry V, a one woman King Lear, some storytelling, and we're excited to be collaborating with the Radnorshire Wildlife Trust in a project bringing arts and nature together and with colleagues at Exeter University towards contributing something at COP in Glasgow this autumn. And the Willow Globe Company will finally be able to start rehearsals for Cymbeline live. And if we can't, for whatever reason, have an audience, we shall just film it. Workshops on Zoom will continue. Amy Marchant, based in London, our MC for today, is offering a locked down acting up program for young people. And Amy Corbett, based in Bath and a long time associate, continues to lead on a online have a go sessions, which participants say are the highlight of their week. And we actually do hope to bring back live have a goes if we possibly can. And the venue that we host them in London Wells is Kelver Gumpus, which means art for all. And Kelv have sent us a birthday card for Shakespeare for today. Happy birthday, Will. And Ian Yeoman. And Ian Yeoman. Okay, lovely. Uh, am I back now, Erin? Are we back in the main room? Okay, showing the card. Okay. Lovely. Um, well, it was so, so wonderful to see Phil and Sue there in the open air of the Willow Globe. Um, and obviously this summer sets to, is set to be a, a, a huge summer for open air theatre. Um, but just as Tom was saying earlier, uh, lots of theatre companies have looked to other ways of making work and uh, the Wet Mariners are, are no different. And James Corrigan has led the Macbeth the Movie project um, from the end of last year, uh, just up until, well, still still going, still still running. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to James now to talk a little bit about, um, about that project. Thanks, James. Hello, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Um, I am another Wet Mariner, and uh, I'll be playing underneath is just some of the stuff that we've been sort of uh, filming recently. Uh, there'll be no sounds, so it'll just be my dulcet terms, tones are really working uh, in an awful juxtaposition with the intensity of what the rest of the Mariners are bringing. Um, just going to get out my notes. So basically, um, last year, uh, obviously in the face of not being able to uh, do live theatre, we as Mariners kind of went into overdrive and uh, thinking of other mediums in which we could uh, present some work. Um, as Tom touched on, obviously we did, we've been immortalized on YouTube forever with the Midsummer Night stream. Um, we haven't reached the lofty heights of, um, of uh, getting a, a monkey to appear and, and disappear, but we did also film uh, a sort of like a National Theatre Live type comedy of errors, which Kat will go on to talk about later. And we thought, why not go the whole hog and compete with uh, Denzel Washington and um, the Coen brothers and their uh, um, upcoming release of Macbeth and uh, take them on in a, in a ratings battle and uh, film uh, our very own feature of Macbeth. Um, now in True Mariner's style, our aim is to film it all in a week with uh, zero budget uh, and relying on all the gusto that we can sort of muster. Now we opted for Macbeth because it's uh, you know it's just so filmic in its pace. It's it's very claustrophobic, so we can sort of do that in in um, in tight spaces and very few lens choices. Um, we also conceived of the idea in winter uh, when everything was kind of bleak, so it sort of felt uh, we felt in that headspace, I suppose. Crucially, also the play is short, which is very very useful when you have no money. Um, I'm no Fefferdando, but we're hoping to pull it off. Um, 
Now, for this project, obviously, we wanted a location as beautiful as the Willow. It's not going to happen. But we came close in that Amy managed to get um, Echo's old school, uh, Dulwich College, um, which is less of a school, more of a castle. Uh, it's also fitting because it was also founded in 1619 by an Elizabethan actor, uh, Edward Ned Allen. Um, and the school have been so, so supportive. So if they're watching, a massive thanks to them. Not only have they provided some incredibly atmospheric locations and sets and props, but also some of their students. Um, and you'll see uh, on, on the clips um, an amazing young talent uh, called Ashton playing Fleance. Um, and we've got some, some others that we get to work with uh, later on. Um, I mean, aside from a shared love of Elizabethan theatre, we uh, have more in common with Ned Allen, um, which is several lockdowns. Um, and uh, so whilst Ned was um, prevented from giving his Jew of Malta, uh, our initial plans of filming in January were scuppered by the... Um, by, by a big wave, as you well know, right at the beginning of January. So we postponed to this Easter. And uh, this Easter, uh, we again uh, encountered some problems with uh, COVID protocol and um, just some scheduling conflicts. So we post pushed it back to the summer, but we made use of both of those periods. So in Easter, so a couple of weeks ago, what you're watching now, we filmed over four days. We decided to try out different styles. Um, we... Um, it was also just really lovely just getting back in a room, basically, and just um, acting together. I mean, we were um, we were tested up to the nines, so that goes without saying, lateral flow tests all over the place. But it, uh, so it felt very safe, but it also it obviously was just really great to be back on a different sort of stage together. Um, our other period we used in January was... Um, we sort of went back to the, uh, our roots on Zoom uh, to uh, rehearse and indeed film with three mariners who don't live in London. And we wanted to do what we did with the Midsummer Night Stream, which was make sure that every single mariner is involved. So we've been practicing some camera trickery, uh, which you might see in one of the other clips coming up, um, to uh, ensure that our, our mariners who are based in the US or Manchester and are our witches, uh, can also be involved. Uh, our plan is now to film it in the summer holidays uh, in and around Dulwich College as well as some other locations. Um, I think we've settled on a sort of aesthetic. I mean, we're all really new to this. So that was the other thing was um, we've got no, we've just got the gear that we've got and uh, the um, enthusiasm that we've got. And it was great all having a go at using the boom. Um, Oh, hang on, I'll, I think I started it from the wrong place. Um, having a go at the boom, having a go at uh, lighting, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, hopefully we come up with something relatively professional looking, um, but mainly for the Shakespeare Link audience. Um, so yeah, look out for uh, hopefully the autumn when we'll have something to show you all. Uh, wish us luck. And if you've got any knowledge on how to make a film, please do email us because um, we'll take all the help we can get. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, James, so much. Um, again, yeah, changing methods, learning new things. That's what this year has uh, all, all been about and wonderful for us to see that footage, which um, the Wet Mariners won't have seen. Uh, that was a surprise to all of us as well. <laughs> Absolutely amazing, thank you. Um, so I think it's time for us to head over to the Sack and Ale Bar for another drink. So um, thank you, Erin.
Hello everyone, welcome back and a big hello to all our international watchers today, especially Ashley in Colorado, who very kindly donated to Shakespeare Link earlier this year. Big hello to her and also to Lol and Kate in the garden. No more specific than that. Um, we are going to head over to New York City now and talk to Jane Bradley, who is a member yet again of the Wet Mariners. Sorry, the second half is quite Mariner heavy, um, but is also a member of a theatre company called The Drilling Company in New York. And this is a company who produce two out outdoor Shakespeare uh, festivals every year, um, one called Shakespeare in the Parking Lot and the other Bryant Park Shakespeare. So perhaps Jane, you could kick us off by telling us a little bit about uh, what Shakespeare in the Parking Lot is. Absolutely, thanks Amy. Um, so yes, The Drilling Company is a company that's been in New York for about 30 years and for almost all of that time they have produced uh, a very singular Shakespeare Theater Festival called Shakespeare in the Parking Lot. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. So for the last 25 years in an active parking lot in uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, the Drilling Company has produced free Shakespeare productions for the people of New York City. Um, this was inspired by Joe Papp, who some of you may have heard that name. He is the founder of the Public Theater. Um, and they, of course, produced Shakespeare in the Park, which is the United States sort of quintessential outdoor Shakespeare production company. So using that model and giving it a bit more of an urban edge, um, the drilling company has taken that outdoor Shakespeare tradition and translated it to the asphalt. Um, so every year we occupy a parking lot. Now it is um, actually a private parking lot. For years and years, it was a municipal parking lot. So it was owned by the city. Cars would come in and out during the productions. Um, but now it is in fact a reserved space for our shows, which is a luxury we never thought we would have. Uh, but nonetheless, there is street activity going by behind us. There are New Yorkers popping in and out, some of whom think they're there to find parking and then discover that they've stumbled upon King Lear. Um, and it's a really unique New York City experience. It's something that garners a lot of attention for the novelty of it, but I think that people who do discover it, either via media or just walking by, end up staying for the Shakespeare, which is a really lovely thing um, in that it has sort of transcended the novelty and, and become a cultural fixture in New York in terms of, of uh, what it offers. And I think the other really special thing about it, uh, in addition to the location, is that it is free and it always has been free, um, just like Shakespeare in the Park. And so it is uh, entirely donation-based um, with some, um, uh, funding from the government as well, um, and just really built on the goodwill of the people who participate in these shows, um, which makes it a really special thing and adds to that sense of it being a real community offering, uh, because not only is it in such a, a, a space that feels accessible to all of us, right, a, a parking lot is something that we all spend time in at some point, but also it's, it's just a gift. It's just a gift for the people of New York City. Wonderful. I think we've got some images of Shakespeare in the parking lot, uh, various productions to show, Erin, if you're able to. Uh, you've already shown them. Uh, already shown them. I see. Well, they are in the Dropbox folder for everybody here to see. Um, Jane, can you tell what, what challenge it? I love what you were saying about how accessible it makes Shakespeare just by changing that location so radically. Um, what challenges did you find as an actor um, in a space like that? Oh, Amy, the challenges abound. Um, it is a very, uh, as I said, it's a very active space. So that means many things. When it was a municipal parking lot, we would, so the way it worked is we would reserve two parking spaces through the city. And those would be our, our playing space. We would purchase those two spaces for the duration of the summer. But you couldn't guarantee that a car wouldn't be in one of those two spaces when you arrived at half hour. So if that was the case, we would still begin the production, car or none. Um, and one of my absolute favorite moments during these shows 
would be the moment when the person would arrive to pick up their car. And they would see an audience of 300 people watching Othello happen on top of their car. And there would be this incredible surge of applause that when people realized that the owner of the car had come to collect their vehicle. And then we would all very ceremoniously stop the play and sort of watch the person drive away and then resume. And if anything, it added to the moment, regardless of whether or not it was totally appropriate. It was just... There's a wonderful picture of you playing Hamlet uh, with the skull. I think it's on a car. Was that a car that was meant to be there or? Yeah, yes, that, that one was staged. So in fact, there was a little bit less chaos, but I will say that one uh, particular evening doing Othello, I played Amelia. That was actually my first parking lot show. And um, the driver arrived during my death scene. So we had to stop mid fight, myself and my evil husband, Diago, uh, in order to allow the owner of his car to drive home. So, you know, you not, just adapt. You not just, much room for your process as the actor. You know, you build it in. It becomes, it's like a sporting event as much as it is a Shakespeare production. You know, the adaptability is key. Keep it so alive and I know when, uh, people perform at the willow, they have to incorporate birds and sheep and- Exactly near- that. It's very much in the spirit of the Mariners, yeah. 100% chaos field. Um, and Jane, I think you said that there was uh, some celebrations going on for for Shakespeare's birthday in New York, um, which I think you might be a part of. What's, what's that? That's right, yes. So we are actually going to be the first Shakespeare company to resume live performance tonight um, at 7 p.m. So in eight hours here, uh, we will be heading to the parking lot to perform a live uh, Shakespeare birthday celebration. And it will be very much like this, a collection of scenes and monologues and songs from our company's members. And it is all COVID compliant, um, socially distanced, limited audiences. We, we don't usually reserve, we usually make it just stand by and people arrive early, but for the purposes of this, we've had to sort of do online reservations just to make sure that there aren't too many people gathering outside and we're sold out. So I think it's going to be quite a celebration. I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, I'm sure we'd all like to wish Jane a massive good luck for later on. And it's incredible to talk to someone who is leading the way in the return from COVID in theater uh, in New York. So thanks so much, Jane. We wish you a really, really happy summer. Uh, ahead there. Um, okay, so three more wonderful contributions to go. Um, and we are going to show a clip from Cymbeline. Uh, it's the uh, Cloten and Guidarius uh, fight scene. Um, so if you haven't seen the play and you're planning to see it uh, this summer at the Willow, there is a, a, a somewhat of a spoiler. So uh, look away if you need to. Thank you very much, Erin. I cannot find those runagates. That villain hath mocked me. I am faint. Thou injurious thief, hear but my name and tremble. What is thy name? Cloten, thou villain. Cloten, the double villain be thy name. I cannot tremble at it, be it toad or adder, spider, t'would move me sooner. Yield, rustic mountaineer!
Welcome back, everybody. We're going to make our last international stop of the afternoon by flying over to Frankfurt to meet PJ and hear about his theatre company over there. They're new friends of the Willow Globe, and we're delighted to have them with us today. Hi, PJ. Hi, Amy. Thanks for the uh, intro, and I just want to say thank you to the Willow. Uh, it's been great to be able to collaborate with you guys to celebrate Bill's birthday today. So um, happy birthday, Bill. Hope we're not doing anything to make you spin in your grave yet. Um, so uh, just to give you a little quick heads up about what we did over this time, all of us, all of us as theater makers have struggled to try and figure out how we can still achieve a certain level of creativity while also still serving our communities. And um, what we discovered is that um, for our flagship program that we do every year, we do um, promenade theater in a botanical garden here in Frankfurt. They shut down the garden. We bring in an audience of about 70. And of course we move them around the garden for the entire show. Um, we don't tend to cut it down that short. So for instance, this year we're doing King Lear and it's still gonna run about three hours. But um, fortunately because we're outside and our show time's around seven, we usually get the sunset right at the end of the play. Um, last year we were scheduled to do Comedy of Errors and that fell through because of the pandemic. But fortunately we have a very, intimate ensemble of performers and talent. And we came together and decided what can we do to serve our community still, even though we can't be there with them in the garden. So we put together a format of a number of scenes based on the concept of the breath of life. Those moments in life in Shakespeare's work that make you inhale or exhale, those life-changing moments. Um, and uh, we got uh, about I think a dozen actors, eight scenes. We filmed it over a period of a uh, month and a half where we only shot on Sundays. And each scene we only rehearsed three times um, in an effort to conserve the amount of time and energy the artists were working. Um, the piece that we're gonna share with you guys today is uh, Romeo and Juliet, act two, scene five, when Juliet finds out the news from the nurse about whether or not Romeo is into her. <laughs> So uh, with that, uh, if, if you guys can go ahead and run the clip, that'd be great. And thanks again for having us. It's been a real pleasure watching today's share of everyone's work. The clock struck nine when I did send the nurse. In half an hour, he promised to return. Perchance he cannot meet him. That's not so. Now is the sun up on the highmost hill of this day's journey, and from nine till twelve is three long hours, yet he's not come. Had he affections and warm youthful blood, he would be as swift in motion as a ball. My words would bandy him to my sweet love and his to me, but old folks, many fain as they were dead, unwieldy, slow, heavy, and pale as lead. <sighs> oh God, he comes. Oh, honey nurse, what news? Hast thou met with him? Oh Lord, why lookest thou sad? No news be sad, yet tell them merrily. If good thou shames the music of sweet news by playing it to me with so sour a face. I am a weary. Give me leave a while. Fie how my bones ache. What a jaunt have I had. I would thou hadst my bones and I thy news. Nay, come, I pray thee, speak, good goodness, speak. Jesu, what haste! Can you not stay a while? Do you not see that I'm out of breath? How art thou out of breath when thou hast breath to say to me that thou art out of breath? The excuse that thou dost make in this delay is longer than the tale thou dost excuse. Is thy news good or bad? Well, you have made a simple choice. You know not how to choose a man. Romeo? No, not he. Though his face be better than any man's, yet his leg excels all men's. And for a hand and a foot and a body... Though they be not to be talked on, yet they are past compare. He's not the flower of courtesy, but I'll warrant him as gentle a lamb. All this, <laughs> this did I know before. What says he of our marriage? What of that? Lord, how my head aches. What a head of I. It beats as it would fall in twenty pieces. My back, <laughs> to the other side. Mm. Mm. My back, my back! I shrill your heart for sending me about to catch my death with jaunting up and down. Your faith, I am sorry that thou art not well. 
Sweet, sweet, sweet nurse. Tell me what says my love. <laughs> Your love says like an honest gentleman, and a courteous, and a kind, and a handsome, and I'll warrant a virtuous. Where is your mother? Where is my mother? Why, she's within, where should she be? How oddly thou repliest! Your love says, like an honest gentleman. Where is your mother? God's lady, dear, are you so hot? Is this the poultice for my aching bones? <laughs> Henceforward, do your messages yourself. Oh, you're such a coil! Come, what says Romeo? Have you got leave to go to Shrift today? I have. Then hie you hence to Friar Lawrence's cell. There stays a husband to make you a wife. <laughs> now comes the wanton blood up in your cheeks. They'll be in scarlet straight at any news. <laughs> and the trudge and toil and your delight. But you shall bear the burden soon at night. Go, I'll to dinner, hie you to the cell. I toy fortune. Honest nurse. Oh, well. <laughs> Amazing to see that scene uh, from Frankfurt in that incredible botanical gardens, um, which leads us on really nicely, almost as if we planned it to Cat Jack, who's going to tell us about the uh, famed production of the Comedy of Errors that was able to be performed in between two moments of lockdown last year. Cat, um, thanks so much. Hello, yes. Uh, happy birthday, Shakespeare. And lovely to be here and to see everybody um, as well. I'll keep this very short. And there is a video as well showing some selection of the show, Comedy of Errors, that some of the, the wet mariners, again, I'm sorry to, <laughs> to, to go on about the wet mariners again, but a few of us, we, um, we go to the Willow every year uh, and perform a Shakespeare. And yes, in, this, uh, in 2020, we managed to do it as well, which we were delighted about. And it was the comedy of errors, as said. So uh, later on, there'll be some, some snippets of that for you to, to feast your eyes on. And uh, firstly, I guess, yeah, on the 2nd of April 2020, the Mariners, the 10 of us, um, met on Zoom and we read the play that we'd been planning to do since sort of late 2019, I guess, early 2020, which was The Merchants of Venice. And we'd already thought about the poster, what that might look like for The Willow. And I'd listened to many podcasts about the complexities and uh, you know, ambiguous portrayal of Shylock and, you know, all of this. And then we read it and, you know, had a really good time. And of course, I mean, I'm not here to categorise that play. There is, you know, it's, I guess, technically a comedy. Anyway, um, yeah, but we, we went down that for a bit. And then as the pandemic situation became more apparent to definitely to us in the UK and obviously globally, um, we just felt for some reason that that wasn't going to serve us or the Willow community necessarily for that for, for 2020. I'm sure there is a way that it could have, but for us, we just felt like it wasn't going to fit. And it goes back to what Tom was talking about earlier about um, the Mariners responding to, and has everybody has done on this call actually, um, responding to, to the environment that you're in and to the time that you're in. So we changed tack and we thought that sort of fast um, absurdist comedy um, was going to be much more fitting for us and obviously for us as well as actors um, a lot more fun <laughs> so we went with the comedy of errors so I think it's interesting to think about you know responding and changing um, in light of what ha is still continuing to happen but in light of 2020 and pandemic um, and that goes to say uh, also that play has the reuniting of two sets of twins, obviously. So the idea of coming back together was something that we talked about um, as well, which was just, yeah, really, I thought was really important for us to, to think about. The other thing just quickly to note is that we also had conversations once we had got there. There were four of us um, that managed to be able to join to do the show. Um, we had conversations about how much to reference um, COVID-19 or not, or to make, you know, to talk with levity about the situation. So that's another interesting conversation about being responsive 
to the time and um, whether to, you know, reference wearing masks or, or things like that. You'll see from the video, your snippets later, the judgment that we made, which was um, not really to reference it so much. Um, so another interesting thought process, I think, in how to make um, theatre in that time, which was quite acutely close to the pandemic. Um, uh, yeah, that's what we thought about. So as we said, four of us uh, made it to the Willow and uh, we we were the four that had the, the time and the ability to isolate beforehand uh, and such like and make it as COVID safe as possible. So we were the four that turned up and the restriction of having four people do comedy of errors was an absolute delight. Um, again, sort of using what you're working with in terms of, um, well, firstly, you could only have 30 people outdoor gathered um, in Wales at the time. So obviously that includes the actors. So if we had any more than four actors, you're cutting even further down on your audience. So it was actually really great to have just four of us in some ways, so we could have more people as come to see it. Um, and just quickly about that as well, the challenges of having only four of us play all those roles. I was lucky enough to only play a couple, so I was fine. But it also meant that, you know, adding to the absurdist nature of it, there were wigs aplenty, terrible accents aplenty, talking about myself, just in a sheer grasping, trying to define some difference of character. And also Tom um, had played the most characters, and I can't even remember how many. But again, bold choices and changing wigs last minute. And the, um, the, the other restriction I put on us is that the Mariners normally are out in the audience, out round the Willow. We saw the pictures of the Willow earlier, like running around, like the, the fight that we saw, the beautiful, the amazing fight, the choreography there. Um, we would normally perhaps do that with the audience, but we were restricted to stay safe on stage away from the other households in the audience. So that meant that in one particular scene where Tom, we were in a chase and Tom had to change character too many times to count, uh, he didn't have any time or length to change character apart from the size of the stage. So again, uh, just the restrictions imposed on us for having to stay safe on the stage as a household that we'd created, the actors, we were able to be close, uh, meant for what I found the most joyous thing to watch every time was Tom frantically changing character several times in the space of a metre or in the space of like two seconds. Um, so... Yes, uh, I think I'll leave it there. I was going to talk more about um, the, the COVID things and keeping it safe. Louise, um, a special shout out to her and to everybody at the Willow made every effort to, to make it safe and, and COVID um, compliant. Um, so we had a lot to think about, a lot of planning to do, but also being prepared to chuck those plans out of the window at the last minute. Um, but yes, it was great fun and you'll see some snippets from it uh, later. Uh, I at the end. Great, thank you so much, Kat. I was able to pop up and see that production, and I was just bowled away by it. And uh, apologies, everyone watching later. The cackle that you can hear in the audience is um, not the ghost of Barbara Windsor. It is, in fact, me. Um, James assures me that that was useful for editing purposes, but I, I'm not. I'm not very sure about that. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful show, and. Kat didn't mention that they had to do it five times in two days and were absolutely exhausted, but they did brilliantly. It was incredible. Um, okay, so now we are at the finale of our afternoon celebrations and we've reached our Shakespeare themed quiz. So I hope our expert panel are ready. I hope the rest of us, our team of amateurs are ready. Um, if that's okay, Gavin, I'll hand over to you. Perfect. Welcome, welcome. Uh, our two teams today, uh, our Shakespeare eggheads first, um, Phil Bowen, Sue Best, well, I mean, if they uh, um, haven't acted in or directed most Shakespeare plays, certainly more than we've had hot dinners, I'd be amazed. Uh, with them, are they young Turks uh, with their leather jackets and black coffee? Uh, Tom Sims and James Corrigan, welcome to them. Uh, our other team is everybody else on the Zoom call, uh, friends of uh, certainly of the Willow Globe. Uh, so we'll see all sorts of people popping up there. I intend to um, ask each team questions in turn, and if they can't offer it uh, an answer, I will offer it over to the to the other team. So 
let's go. An easy one, just to get us warmed up. What was the name of Shakespeare's wife? Who's that question for, Gavin? The expert. That's, sorry, sorry. This is Shakespeare eggheads. Are you unmuted? Yeah. <laughs> James, uh, do you know? You must know. It'll be Oscar winner, Anne Hathaway. <laughs> Anne Hathaway. You see, it was easy, wasn't it? Right, now then, for a bonus point, can you tell me when they got married? <laughs> As a clue... Shakespeare was 18 mm. at the Crikey. time. I think his first wife. Mm. He, M M Anne Hathaway. Mm. Anne um, Hathaway. Yeah, and when yeah. did they get married? Yeah, what, when, when did he get married? Get married? Was Shakespeare... Well, when he was 18, so 64, <laughs> 74, 82. 82. <laughs> Bonus point. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Two points for the Shakespeare eggheads. Now then, for the rest of the world... What is Robin Goodfellow better known as? He's the best of Oh, Puck from Puck. In the last part, oh, Robin shall restore a man. Puck it is. And the play? Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. Excellent. Now, we're getting trickier now. Uh, Shakespeare eggheads, in which play are the people of Dalmatia referred to? Cymbeline. Cymbeline, it is. So one and point for that. the Dalmatians. That's it. Uh, now, the, uh, the people of Dalmatia are also offered um, by a different name in a different Shakespeare play. Now then, can you tell me this, uh, the country of Dalmatia appears under a different name in another Shakespeare play? <laughs> mm. If I tell you, to give you a little bit of a clue, a shipwrecked mariner asks where she is. And the answer is, yeah. this is Illyria, lady. <laughs> Well, it could be Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night it is. Twelfth Night it is. Where are the rest right. of us been? Now then, question four for the rest of the world. <clears throat> um, the expression bacon-fed only occurs in one play. Who uses it and which play? I'll give you the line. Ah, horse and caterpillars, bacon-fed knaves. What do we think, amateurs? Any thoughts? Could it be full stuff? Oh, spot Brilliant. on. Yes. Well done. Can you tell me the play? Um, well done. Can anyone can anyone care to guess the play? Anyone Henry think? the Fourth. We'll go with Henry, Henry the Fourth. One or two, probably one. One. It is spot on. Hey. Well done. Oh. Excellent. Right, back to the Shakespeare eggheads. Which character and in what play, and I think you'll bite my hand off when you hear the last line, which character says, and well you know the superstitious idle-headed eld received and did deliver to our age this tale of Hearn the Hunter for a truth. See, Mary Wives. I yes. think I played that person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Mary Wives. Mary it's Wives of Windsor. Mistress Page. Mistress Page. Mistress Page. Page. Oh, well done. Wow. <laughs> You're on the ball today. My word. Right. <laughs> Question six for the rest of the world. Who said, give me my robes, put on my crown. I have immortal longings in me. I, mm. Any thoughts, amateurs? Is it? Is it from Anthony and Cleopatra? Oh, it is. Well done. 
Nice one. Well done. Mm. Now, can you, who actually says it? Cleopatra? Uh, yes. <laughs> Is it that? Well done. Oh, well well done. done. Very good effort. <laughs> oh. Wow. Uh, right. In uh, Back to Shakespeare Eggheads, um, in Love's Labour's Lost, are the lords of the court forced to renounce women for three weeks, three months, or three years? Oh, we did it, so we should know. Yeah. I feel like it's three, three years. months, but what do we think, team? I feel like three months. Yes. Three years. Yeah, three months, yeah. <laughs> Three years would be cruel. Yeah, far too cruel. It's, it's three actually years. three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. You should listen to Phil, he was saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, over to the rest of the world. Who says, and in what play, we are such stuff as dreams are made of? Prospero. Prospero. Tempest. The Tempest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Back to our Shakespeare egg heads. How many characters die in Hamlet? Four, eight, or fifteen? Eight. Yeah, must be. It's eight. Quite right. Well done. Right, back to rest of the world. What's the only Shakespeare comedy to be set in England? Merry Wives of Windsor. It is indeed the Merry Wives of Windsor. The amateurs are keeping up very well. They are. Right, now then. The French expression, d'Angleterre, of England occurs three times in only one Shakespeare play and no other. Which play? Henry V. Henry yeah, yes, Henry V. No. Makes absolute sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Is it Henry V? Henry V. In Midsummer Night's Dream, what is Bottom's trade? Is it weaver. Us? Sorry, yeah. he's a weaver. Yes, a weaver. Well done. Right. Uh, question thirteen: What magic does the flower Love in Idleness perform? You fall. Yes, is it our turn? Yeah, it makes you love the first thing you see, doesn't it? Yes. yes. When you open your eyes. It makes you fall in love with the first person you see. The first person you see when you wake, yeah. That's it. Absolutely right. Two points. (laughs) What is thought to be Shakespeare's last play? Henry VIII? Or to no kinsman then? No, not Henry VIII. This is rest of the world. Anybody else? I think it's the Tempest. It's the Tempest. Quite right. Quite right. It is the Tempest. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, doesn't like the play. <laughs> <laughs> right. Question 15 for the Shakespeare eggheads. What is, uh, sorry, how many sonnets did Shakespeare write? Oh, oh, is that my, oh, is it? Oh, uh, yeah. It must be, it's a hundred and something, isn't it? Yeah. hundred and hundred and fifty something. Oh, you're getting very close now. 149. 50, 154? Yes. Mm. Absolutely right. Oh, now then. <laughs> um, can you tell me what year they were written in for a bonus point? Oh. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. We can't. <laughs> you get a point. Um, we, can right, tell, we can tell the answer to that one. 
because we had a festival, 1609. Oh, spot on. Oh, great. Well done. Very well good. Done Impressive. Done. And last play for the rest of the world. Uh, sorry, last question. Which of Shakespeare's plays is actually the shortest? Comedia Veras. Comedia Veras it is. Way. Well done. Right, I'll just quickly count you up. Rest of the world, 16 points. Shakespeare Eggheads. Thirteen points. <laughs> Incredible! There we go. Well done. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Little gray cells were working. Thank you to our very own Jeremy Paxman. Much funny. Much funny looking. Uh, thanks, Excellent. So the only thing left to do is to sing happy birthday to Shakespeare and yeah. to cut our cake. Um, are we ready for that, Jackie? Uh, yeah, I've got uh, I've got my phone pointed at the cake. Oh wow! Is it a flame? Should I move it? You can. You oh, there's no can There's no candle. Oh. No candle. It's a phenomenal. It's a oh, statue. <laughs> Okay, well then, um, uh, let's all sing. And remember, don't start too high, folks, because the song does go up. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Very happy to see you. Happy birthday to you. From Deb's, I think if we could just uh, uh, zoom in and have a look at that. Are we going to cut the cake? Oh, dare we do we dare? Do we dare? Go on, Sue. Cut the cake. Go on, then. <sighs> I'm going to have to cut. I can't cut through this wallflower. There's a wallflower. There's a daisy. There's some beautiful. Oh, thing. There's rosemary. There's raspberries. There's cream. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Could you, could you email me a slice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gosh, how beautiful. And there he is. Can you see him all right? Yay. He's a fantastic fellow. Well, that's it, I think, for the afternoon. Um, Brilliant. Thank you all so much for being with us uh, to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday and to open the Willow Globe 2021 season. We hope that we'll be able to welcome as many of you as will allow this summer and to share cake and ale and everything together in the same place uh, once more and 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 uh, and, and share in, in all the joy that, that we've missed out in the last few years. And uh, to our international friends who've joined us today, absolutely wonderful to meet you, see yes. you again. Our doors are always welcome if you care to visit. Um, we'd love to see you. Um, and that's it from me and Phil and Sue and Jackie and Erin. Thank you so much. Um, don't forget the Shakespeare's Globe event this weekend if you'd like to hop onto that now, if you haven't had enough Shakespeare juice already. Um, and we will see you very soon. Lots of love from all of us and goodbye. And well done, Amy. Bye-bye. Well done, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. As you can see, there's only four of us of the ten mariners. We are the four who are able to form this little safety pod. Um, there are about 20 characters in the play. I'm playing two of them, James is playing two of them, Kat's doing three of them, and Tom's... Too many. <laughs> Far too many. Ten, nine, nine eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Therefore, give out. You are of Epidamnum. Lest that your goods.
too soon be confiscated. <laughs> Hold. Take down that. <laughs> and that. <laughs> for God's sake, why am I beaten? It's time for such things. Soft. <laughs> Who wafts us yonder? Aye, <laughs> aye, Antipholus. I am possessed with an adulterate blot. My blood is mingled with the crime of lust. For if we two be one and thou play false, I do digest the poison of thy flesh, being strumpeted by thy contagion. Keep them fair quarter with thy true bed. I live unstained, thou undishonoured. <laughs> Plead you to me, Fede. <laughs> I know you're not. Come again when you may. Who art thou? Ho! Oh, open the door! Right, sir. Uh, hmm. I'll tell you when, you tell me wherefore. Wherefore? For my dinner. I have not dined today. Yeah, nor today here. You must not. Come again when you may. What art thou that keeps me from the house I owe? Or oh, the porter for this time, sir. And my name is Dromeo. <gasps> Villain! Thou hast stolen both mine office and my name! The one that... Shh! Shh! <laughs> 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 well met, well met, Master Antipholus! Please! <laughs> 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 Master, be wise! <laughs> and if you give it her, the devil will shake her chest and try to with it! I pray thee, the chain of or else the ring you had of me. I hope you do not mean to cheat me so. <laughs> Good Dr. Pin! <laughs> you are a conjurer. Establish him in his true sense again, and I will please you what you will demand. Alas! How sharp and how fiery he looks! Mark how he trembles in his ecstasy! Give me your hand and let me feel your pulse! Ooh. Here is my hand, let it feel your ear! Oh! I charge me, Satan, housed within this man, to yield unto my holy prayers! <laughs> and to thy state of darkness, hide thee straight! Watcher! Watcher! <laughs> I conjure thee by the spirits of the willow and all the ancient sprites and goblins of this land, of these ancient woods, be gone from this man! <laughs> Peace! Don't say wizard! I'm not mad! Okay, come on now, let's be honest. It's been locked down. We've been on the sofa a little bit too much. Yeah, too many few TV dinners. So let's get up and let's burn some of those locked down pounds. That's it, on your feet. That's it, on your feet. We'll start with an easy one. I call this Climb the Stairs. Climb the Stairs. Climb the Stairs. Pete, be quiet. Wherefore throng you hither? <laughs> to fetch my poor distracted husband hence, let us come in that we may bind him fast and bear him home for his recovery. Father, take these and put them with the others. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities. I never saw the child. Hey, 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 h